I'm going to break protocol on that idea of everything we do here being five minutes late, uh, in part because of uh, the great opportunity to make use of every minute of our guest speaker today, that uh, uh, as a robotics community, uh, we're aware for the most part that robotics was not much of a consciousness in the realm of space, maybe 20 years ago, uh, that uh, uh, it, it, back in the day, it was uh, uh, a model of human exploration, and uh, robotics was the late comer, and uh, now has risen to relevance. And uh, my guess is there's no stopping it uh, beyond the exploration. Uh, the day, there was a day when the uh, humanoids were a lot of science fiction and fantasy, and um, uh, my guess is that we'll hear that uh, they're doing well enough on the station now and with uh, a great future. Uh, we're very, very privileged uh, to have Mike Gazard with us today. At the time of the invitation and the uh, acceptance, uh, Mike uh, was already uh, uh, deeply uh, experienced in uh, technologist, engineer, uh, manager, and leader, and then in the interim has uh, risen on high as uh, an associate administrator of NASA. Mike Desire. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks, Fred. Well, listen, it's great to be here, and I appreciate you taking some time on a Friday afternoon, <laughs> uh, late in the afternoon, you know, to come. I, I know, uh, so for those of you who don't know, I, I, I grew up here. I grew up in Pittsburgh, um, uh, up on the Allegheny River. So, and I went to the University of Pittsburgh, that school down the street a little bit. Um, certainly on a Friday, I probably, you know, like you would probably rather be somewhere in the Strip District, you know, getting a, a Permanis cheesesteak and, uh, and their number one bestseller. Um, so, uh, but I'll try to entertain you. Hopefully, make an informative here for the next hour, and then we can go <laughs> to Permanis and go get a cheesesteak and, 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 and maybe a cold soda. Um, you know, really appreciate. Had a great day today uh, uh, here, looking at some of the work. Um, I, I'm, I live now in Washington D.C., so I'm at NASA headquarters. Um, so I'm in the Beltway. I don't really get to do too much other than spreadsheets and sound bites. And so to go see hardware today was absolutely fantastic, and some of the great work you know that's going on here in in, uh, in Red Shop and and the other labs, it's, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. Um, if you don't know NASA, uh, I'm not going to take you through an org chart or anything, but I've got to set a little bit of the context so you know a little bit what I'm going to talk about today. So there are four mission directorates at NASA. Uh, that's kind of how we organize ourselves. It's a $17 billion organization, 18,000 civil servants, 10 NASA centers um, throughout, and we kind of do four major thrusts. We have aeronautics. Uh, we have science, which, you know, planetary science, earth science, right, heliophysics, astrophysics. We have the human space flight, which is the, uh, the International Space Station and, and uh, human exploration. And then, and then we have the Space Technology Mission Directorate, which is new. It's about a month old, <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact. Now, there's been technology, of course, throughout NASA, but the idea of a standalone mission directorate on par with the other three that I mentioned is, 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 like I said, very new, and it really emphasizes the focus on technology at the agency. It emphasizes the focus on technology from the Obama administration um, in terms of, of pushing forward what we need to do um, in the agency and, and really, you know, the nation. Um, wh what I have here in a couple charts, really, uh, is a little bit about space tech, the mission director, tell you a little bit about why we are, what we're doing, some of the, how, how we're organized a little bit, some of the work that we're doing. And then I got a little bit of focus, maybe a couple charts on robotics, robotics that are in the program, robotics within the agency. Now, given what I've seen today, um, <laughs> I'm not sure I want to show them. <laughs> uh, some of it, A, you already know. B, you all might laugh at. But that's OK. I'm going to take you through them anyway, and then maybe we'll have a little discussion about it. Uh, maybe that's the way it will, will go. So um, where is NASA going today? Anyone know the vision, or think we have a vision, or think we have a destination? Um, we hear criticism of that sometimes, so let me make sure I, you know, I, I try to clear any of that up. The shuttle was retired. You probably know that. The International Space Station is built. It is occupied. 
I go to the I go to the Hill a lot. I go to the Congress a lot, and we get some interesting questions from our congressmen. And one of them, which is, you know, how does the station orbit when there's no one in it? So um, <laughs> it could be robotically controlled, I'm sure, and you, you guys could figure out how to do that. But actually, it is it is it is uh, uh, you know crewed uh, by at least at least three crew members. You know, and they go up right now, and we rely on the Soviets for transportation to and from the station. In the meantime, though, we're relying on companies, SpaceX being one of them, Orbital Sciences Corporation being the other, uh, to develop rockets and, and capsules to both get cargo to the International Space Station. SpaceX has already done it twice. Uh, and, and Orbital uh, Sciences Corporation is about to launch their first vehicle here uh, next month in, in April out of Wallops in Virginia. And eventually crew uh, to the station. And so what the focus really is to have these commercial companies or you know, companies do the transportation, do a service contract, if you will, uh, as we operate the station and do research on the station and learn how to operate and live in deep space. And then beyond that, we want to go to deep space. And so this is kind of what these graphics are about. We want to go above and beyond low Earth orbit. We want to go above and beyond 230 miles above the Earth's surface. We'd like to go a little further than that. To do that, we need a number of things, which we do not have today. We need a heavy lift rocket. We're building that. We need a capsule or a human-rated spacecraft that allow us to operate in space. We're building that. Uh, and then we need a whole host of technologies. Um, and that's where space tech comes in. For one of the reasons why we're here is we've got to develop these things that will allow us to explore deep space. As I'll show in a few charts, what we need to go in space has actually been known for a very long time. In fact, there's, I have a stack of 40 reports that have been done over the past two decades, 20 years of this is what we need to do to go explore deep space. <laughs> and it's been the same list for, for 20 years. Uh, it hasn't changed because we haven't really invested in any of those technologies to allow us to go explore deep space. So uh, the investments from an early stage from space tech mission director have been pretty easy. It's been the same list. And, and I'll go over with that with you in a little bit about what they are. It, it is, um, by and large, by the way, the same list that ancient explorers had uh, when you want to go explore. You need a way to move propulsion. You need a way to live and operate life support systems. Um, you need to be able to communicate optical or radar communication systems. Um, you need a way to get power or energy. Right? It's the same kind of list. It just really you know, changes, uh, it changes a little bit in the technology as we explore. Um, one way to explore, and especially from a robotic uh, point of view, which is largely what we have gone to deep space robotically, we have for a very long time, and um, have any of you, did any of you see the Mars Curiosity landing in August? Yeah? OK. Well, I got a little movie, so I might bore you, but let's see if this plays. And this is an animation uh, and, uh, and, and the real uh, JPL control room the night of August 6th when it landed. So let's see if I can get this to play. Uh oh. No. Well, maybe I won't. OK. Well, you, um, hmm. I guess I should have, we should have tested that. Let me try one more time. Here's you should. Like yeah, right, right here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, give me one second. Okay, Yeah, right, deploy the parachute. So uh, I have the movie directly, so let me just pull that up real quick. Can I do that? All right. It's a, it's a pretty good movie, so it's kind of worth, it's kind of worth seeing. So um, uh, let's see. Of course, you know, the trick is, of course, finding it all the time, right? Um, so um, hopefully you were able to watch that landing or stay up for it, depending on if you were on the East Coast or not. Um, uh, let's see. There it is. Huh. OK. Here it is. See if this plays. Um, and, and so, you know, this represents um, the Mars Science Lab. Of course, as I found out today, you have a, a, a big heritage um, of this rover. And, um, but, yeah, okay, can you hear that? All right. Thanks. That looks good. I'm going to hide it. Coming at hypersonic speeds, right, 11 kilometers a second as we enter the Martian atmosphere. We have seven minutes, right, to get to zero. Five and a half meter diameter, it's the largest uh, heat shield we've ever built, larger than Apollo. What's the delay 
already deployed around Mars at this point? Yeah, I think it's around it was around seven minutes. So the total of seven minutes. Yeah, yeah. So it all it already had landed by the time all this we got the signals. It whatever it did, it, it was over. We just didn't know. I still get goosebumps every time I watch it. So I was in the room next door that night, uh, in the behind the glass wall there. So if you're interested in that, I think it's online, you know, and uh, on YouTube or whatever. Um, but that that that's a great animation. A couple things about that um, um, is I go around and show that, especially from younger students. For those of you who build hardware, you understand. But you know, you see the excitement and joy in a lot of the people at the, on the MSL team. Of course, uh, especially the inter descent and landing team, which actually involves multiple centers, including Langley and Ames. Uh, I knew a lot of those people because I, I I had hardware uh, that I think I show later here on MSL. Um, and so I knew a lot of them. A number of them have worked on that for 10 years. So imagine, you know, I tell people, imagine, you know, as a high school student or undergrad that you work on something your whole, for 10 years, it's all you do. So yeah, the night that it lands, it's, it's a really big deal. It's very emotional uh, because uh, there was a significant risk as you saw that whole sequence of events. Uh, there were over 90 pyrotech firings that had to happen exactly at the right time and they all had to work. If they didn't, it wouldn't work, right? Uh, and that whole sequence of hypersonic entry with a heat shield, Right, coupled with uh, uh, then you have to get to supersonic speeds a little above Mach 1, and then you can pull a parachute. You can't go any, you can't pull the parachute any earlier because it'll shred. Okay, we don't have anything big enough that can sustain the aerodynamic forces um, at the higher speeds. And then you saw the sky crane, the crazy idea about you know uh, use chemical propulsion, lower it down to about 60 feet or 60 meters above the surface, and then lower it, the rover down on a bungee cord. That's effectively what it was, and then and then make sure you fly away <laughs> so you don't land on the rover. Um, that whole sequence, so the Martian atmosphere is very thin. So uh, there's also a great video out there called the seven minutes of tear. So it's, it's seven minutes to go from 11 kilometers a second to zero. Uh, the atmosphere on Mars is a poor excuse for an atmosphere. It really isn't much of an atmosphere at all. It's so thin. So it doesn't slow you down very much. It's, it, uh, on the surface of Mars is equivalent on Earth to about 100,000 feet. So that's how thin it is. But, but it is there. So you, uh, aerodynamically, you cannot ignore it. It will burn you or tear you up. But it also doesn't, doesn't slow you down very much. So I bring that up in a couple ways. Um, it's a metric ton. So it's about the size of a Mini Cooper, weighs a uh, you know, metric ton. That's as most as we can put on the surface of Mars. We cannot put any more mass on the surface. That's it. That's all that system will tolerate. Um, human exploration on Mars requires something estimating around 40 metric tons. So we can't land on the surface given the technologies that we have today. All the technology you saw there, hypersonic entry, heat shield, uh, parachute uh, was all developed in the Vikings in the 70s. So we got to figure out a better way to slow down. That's what it amounts to. A better way to slow down with more mass. Um, and, and by the way, we can only land on less than half the planet. We have to land at below the mean sea level on Mars. We need every ounce of atmosphere that we possibly can. We can't high on, uh, land on the higher elevation, so it limits where we can land on Mars. Um, what is wrong with slowing down in space before you, just before you're about to reach the so the problem with that is, is you know, right now when we when we when we launch, right, we have an upper stage that kicks us, and then we just you know coast, right, and then gravity does the rest. Um, to slow down or do more, you need chemical propulsion. That's mass. We don't have the room for the mass. So the reason why we can't use chemical propulsion, in fact, if you had a heavy enough launch vehicle, 
you could use chemical propulsion the whole way down and skip all this aerodynamic business, you know, just burn. But the problem is you don't have enough mass and the launch vehicles aren't powerful enough today or big enough today at the throws. Now, if the Falcon 9 Heavy shows up, that might change the game a bit. Uh, but e e or when we build the SLS, uh, the heavy lift launch vehicle, that'll change the game a bit and we can go to a chemical means. But even at that, there's a limit to how much mass we can put on the surface. So if, if you actually did that, wouldn't you be making a substantial contribution to the Martian atmosphere, something you didn't want to do? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I think it's still fair, that, that residual I think is still fairly small compared to what's there. Um, I, I haven't done the numbers. Um, you know, it's largely carbon dioxide um, as it is, you know, today. Um, uh, and it, ha it has winter storms and summer storms, and the density changes, you know, fairly significantly, which also is a problem. M my hardware uh, on board, by the way, was we made the first measurements ever of flying through the Martian atmosphere, entry, descent, and landing measurements. It's um, temperature and pressure and, and the amount of uh, ablation, the heat shield ablates, it uh, burns off uh, to slow down. Uh, <clears throat> that, re that resulted in 14 holes in the heat shield. So my, my, my job as a project manager was called Medley was to convince the MSL project manager, Richard Cook at the time, that I was going to put 14 holes in his heat shield and it was going to be okay. Uh, so I was pretty nervous that night just in case I, our testing didn't, wasn't right, you know, but it was all fine. And we have uh, the first time ever measurements of, of that through, through the Martian atmosphere. And it shows how much you, we, we carry a lot of uncertainty uh, in the thickness of the heat shield and, and, and how much mass and margin we need because, you know, you can't be wrong. Yep. Part of the problem you boxed yourself into Thus, you need to do it on a human time scale. If you took a lot more time, you'd get there with a lower velocity. You could go into orbit, use orbital drag, and be basically your solar sails to slow you down you know, yeah. on each side as you come around. And you know, for a robot vehicle that took 20 years to do it, you could actually change the landing parameters quite dramatically. Yeah, that's true. You can, uh, there, you know, uh, human and robotic exploration, you know, is, is debated for some time. I would say now at NASA, more than ever, actually we've gotten away from the or, it's an and. We think, you know, robotic exploration will lead the way, but eventually humans are going to go and, you know, in some cases people would argue, you know, we're going to colonize another planet, right? Should we be, you know, and I'm not, uh, this is not a NASA philosophy, but there are just saying there are some who would argue, do we want to be the way the dinosaurs and, and live only on one planet and if something bad happens to our planet, we have nowhere to go. So there are other arguments for why, you know, we want to send humans, but even at this point, like I said, it, it is an and right now. It is a combination, and I've never seen it as strong as I do today, between robotic exploration and human exploration. So let me just switch gears if I could for a little bit. So that, that's kind of a little bit of the motivation of why you, know, you need space technology. This has a lot of words on it, but it kind of says in essence the same thing. Here's a couple of those 40 reports. Um, my, the way I see space tech though, it really is, uh, we have tough problems in the agency to go solve, to go do deep space exploration. I need the best and the brightest to go work on them. And so space tech is really about reaching out to this community, you, um, among others, to help me solve these problems. And the problems that I'm taking on are not just for NASA, they're for the whole aerospace community. One of the projects that I'll have, I'll talk about in a minute, is to replace hydrazine. Hydrazine is the chemical we use uh, in all spacecraft to maneuver in space. It's terrific performance-wise. Works at low temperatures. You've got to heat it up some, but it has a fairly wide temperature range. Great performance. The problem is extremely toxic to humans. Uh, so when you load the spacecraft on the ground, you can't touch it, you can't breathe it, you can't smell it, can't get it on your skin. It's a big operation. If we can replace hydrazine for the whole aerospace community, uh, that'll save significant costs and, of course, risk to humans. And so it's called green propellant. It's not all that green. But compared to hydrazine, it's, you know, it is green. And so I have a demonstration that, I'm, that I'm, uh, Ball Aerospace uh, and Aerojet are doing for space tech that could demonstrate the performance of a replacement for hydrazine. That's an example of where uh, I'm solving problems not just for NASA, but for the entire aerospace community. Just a little bit about space tech and how we're organized. You know, I don't have any org charts or anything like that. But um, for, for this community, I have nine programs. So I have nine programs within space tech. Uh, space tech, uh, fiscal year 12, we were appropriated from our, you know, from our, from Congress at about 600 million dollars, right? So we have about 600 million dollars across these nine programs where we invest in technology. They're organized in three rows for a reason. Uh, the top row is because uh, is is more of your project focused based approaches to technology. Tell me what you're going to do in two to three years, go build the hardware, demonstrate, fly tests. It's traditional project based. The three in the middle are technology, but they're really investments in people. Um, the research grant program is about uh, graduate fellowships, masters and PhD students, some of which here are, are, are at CMU. 
Um, this is for paying for uh, masters and PhD for U.S. citizens. Uh, you know, and I have 128 scholars that I've picked. I've had two classes so far. I picked 128 uh, out of 37 um, universities. NIAC is, uh, and like we have some NIAC fellows with us uh, here today, it is advanced concepts. And this has um, also, it really is an investment in the community. The NIAC fellows really are more than just uh, you know, paying for the grant for the work, but it's also the development and the sharing of ideas. And so uh, that's an old program that we kind of revected to take a look at very far and, and outreaching ideas. The Center Innovation Fund, like I mentioned, we have 10 centers. Well, this is IR&D money for those 10 centers. The three at the bottom um, are really about technology and developing a business or a market. So small business SBIR is a program that all government agencies or, or most that do R&D have targeted for small businesses. Uh, great innovative ideas that we have that comes out of that program. Flight Opportunities is about developing suborbital rockets. Uh, we're fostering a whole new market, seven companies we have under contract to get to suborbital altitudes. We can put uh, payloads on those so we can you know, raise an industry, at the same time, it's a very efficient and affordable way to mature and develop technology. Centennial Prize is, a, is, a, <clears throat> is our prize program. This is the idea in government where we don't pay you to develop, we just set up a rules of a competition and we pay if you win. We've run um, nine, uh, pr nine challenges so far um, and have given out about $6 million in these prizes. And I have a couple that I'm going to talk about here that we have up and coming that may be of interest to you. So that's kind of the programs we're organizing. And a number of all of these have a competition to them. We all, they all have a competitive element that's open to industry, academia, and others. And so all these you know, are germane, uh, some more than others, you know, especially to universities. Uh, small spacecraft is particularly interesting, I think, because of its affordability. And this is the idea about pushing forward on the idea of CubeSats or NanoSats, very small, very inexpensive uh, satellite systems, very autonomous, and certainly there's some uh, synergies that we saw today about what we could do in terms of robotics that could help the, the small spacecraft or CubeSat uh, area. Uh, PDM, our, our technology demonstrations are about kind of these bigger demonstrations, the last step we hope before the technology will be infused into a mission. And game changing is targeting that three to five region. It's, it's, it's modeled a little bit about the attributes of the DARPA program, some of you may be familiar with. Kind of breakthrough ideas, rapid development, get in, get out quickly, see if it works get into the lab, try to be quick, try to be rapid. Uh, we have a, you know, very broad technical areas um, that we invest in in our game-changing program. What are the areas we're interested in? Here's a couple, and I mentioned earlier, it really gets down to what do we look for for exploration. So small spacecraft, like I mentioned, uh, uh, we have about the five projects there. Uh, again, a number of them, I, I ran my first competition in small spacecraft just this past year, uh, looking at what does it take for small spacecraft. They, they need propulsion. They need communication. Um, one of the big areas is in networking and how do they talk to each other. Another one is in proximity and rendezvous and docking, proximity ops. How do, they, how do two small spacecraft come and mate and, and, and attach each other? Um, the other thing we're doing in small spacecraft is uh, flying a phone. <laughs> uh, so the idea about taking one of our smartphones that we have, it has all the basic functions right, of a spacecraft, uh, computer, camera. GP, uh, uh, G, or a, a radio, often a GPS, uh, and it also has communication abilities. And so can we fly a phone? And so we're going to do that. Uh, it's going to fly when Orbital Sciences flies their Antares rocket here in April. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be looking forward to see uh, how we ruggedize a phone and what it can do uh, in space. As I mentioned earlier, entry descent landing is a big area for us. It's kind of unique to NASA. Not, mother, not many other government agencies if any, land on another surface of a planet that has an atmosphere, even land on another surface of a planet that doesn't have an atmosphere. Either way, you know, it's kind of unique to NASA. So we have a strong investment, as I mentioned earlier, particularly into uh, better parachutes um, and, and inflatable uh, decelerators. These are inflatable drag devices uh, that can fit into the shroud of the rocket and then expand once we get to the planet surface to enable us to have a bigger drag area. You just have to handle the high speeds and the high temperature. Propulsion is a big area for us. If you're going to move in space uh, and operate in space, how you move, of course, is critical. Um, today, we rely on, again, chemical propulsion, primarily cryogenic fluids, and then we coast to where we go. It takes a very long time. So a couple <clears throat> new ideas there are solar sails. Uh, we are building and going to fly in 2014 the world's largest solar sail. So a solar sail uses not, not, not the uh, photonic energy of, of the light, but actually the momentum of the photons. 
you collect it on a big sail, and that's just enough propulsion to move you. So if you have a big enough sail, you can get enough force to, to move, not fast, uh, but it is propellant free. And so the big application here is in monitoring of the sun's weather. There's a great point called L1, the balance of the gravitational forces right between the sun and Earth, a great place to put a satellite to monitor the solar weather. Well, you can imagine if you had a big sail, you could station keep there for a very long time. So the heliophysics is a science group. They're actually very interested in our development and deployment of the world's largest solar sail. It's a, being done by a small company out in uh, California called Lagarde. Um, I mentioned the green propellant. Uh, the other big area for us, kind of shown in that very fuzzy picture, um, is solar arrays, solar electric propulsion. This is the idea to use electric energy, solar arrays on the sun, and then use uh, ionic forces, right, to send out ions, an ion engine, a uh, hull thrusters is, a, is, is another example of this, to move. You don't have a lot of force, but it is continuous acceleration, right, which you don't get with the cryogenics where you just coast. So um, solar electric has been around. You can, you can see them in some of the communication spacecraft today, but they're limited in power. Uh, for, for the things that we want to do, we need upwards of 50 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts, and eventually for human and cargo, 300 kilowatts. Now, to get that, you need bigger arrays. Today's arrays max out in the biggest comp satellite you can find in the Boeing catalog at about 25 kilowatts. And the problem is, if you want to go any larger, you need more cells. The efficiencies, especially for space qualified solar cells, are not very good. They're in the 20% range, um, and they're expensive. So, they're not probably going to get any better soon, although we're working on that. So the idea is you need bigger arrays. You just need more of them. Well, for that, it becomes a structural and a thermal problem. And you have to fold it up to fit into the rocket. So now you need a deployable mechanism, you know, 100-foot array that's got to deploy, be structurally sound, and can handle the thermal properties, you know, being extended. And so we'll, we have investments in there and to develop the world's largest uh, solar arrays, which will allow, then allow us to do solar electric propulsion. Um, robotics, I'll, I'll say a few words because I have a couple charts on that and, and we'll talk a little bit about the area we have there. Manufacturing is a big area for us as well. Uh, President Obama in his State of the Union speech, for those of you who watched it, I don't know if you watched it at this age, I, I don't think I did, but um, I watch it now uh, and uh, it's, you know, he's eventually the boss. Um, but we looked at advanced manufacturing. It's a big push right now, huge area for the United States to get back into advanced manufacturing. <laughs> There's a number of initiatives. Um, that are involved, and so we, we have that as well. Manufacturing is a big part of space. It's often expensive. It's challenging in what we build and how we build it, and so that's an a big area for us. Another big thread for us, is, this is really be communications and navigation. Um, if you've ever seen the pictures from Mars, you may have seen the great pictures, right, that come out of there. Uh, about 80% of the images we take on Mars remain on Mars, <laughs> and that's because we can't, we can't get them over the radio frequency, but you just don't have enough bandwidth. We're effectively exploring the solar system with a dollop modem, is, is pretty much how that translates. And so the obvious solution there is to go to LaserCon, use optical communications. So we're developing a, a demonstration called Laser Communications Relay Demonstration. It'll happen here in a couple years, led by our Goddard Space Flight Center, to demonstrate you know, multi 100 megabits per second link, space link, that will enable us then when we go to the next generation of what we call TDRS, our tracking and relay system, that enables us to connect to the rest of uh, all of our spacecraft, it can go optical, it can go laser calm. And so there are a number of applications and, and other government agencies who are interested in, in optical com communications. So that's a big area of investment for us. Um, the other area is navigation, a better clock. Uh, this is a miniaturized uh, atomic clock being built, built by JPL. A better way to keep time, better way to navigate. Um, it, it'll uh, open up the way we, uh, we can precisely know and navigate where our spacecraft are. When I, when I ran my first selection in TDM, actually what I picked out of that competitive, uh, this was an, uh, last year, August, was the solar sail, that was one I competitively selected, the atomic clock, and the optical communication. That was my three that I picked, and you know, that was our first competitive selections, and off we went. Well, I wasn't this smart, but a blogger had commented as we did a press release, you know, NASA selects these three missions. And they said, hey, look at this. this some, some blogger wrote, I, you know, who it is, I don't know. But he said, look, look at NASA, you know, this is uh, their first selection. And they picked the classic elements of exploration, a sail, a signaling device, and a clock. <laughs> so I wasn't that smart. I wish I would have thought of it, because it was a great way to brand. But it really does paint the picture that exploration is exploration, right? And, and that's still the same things that we need. And, and, the, and all the things that I've been on this list have been on that. You, you can find them in those 40 reports. Um, they're the same kinds of things that we've, been, uh, that we've been needing. And these kind of reflect about some of the areas of what we need to do for exploration at NASA. Let me give you a couple charts, just some pictures. 
of, of the types of things we're working on. And then, and then I'm going to move into the robotics you know, uh, section of a couple charts and tell you what we're doing in robotics. Um, uh, some of these I've already mentioned, um, including uh, our work. And this is a hypersonic uh, inflatable uh, three meter diameter. This is what, what flew our, our first uh, sounding rocket test of, of that device. It's a hypersonic inflatable. It flew at hypersonic speeds off the coast of Wallops, came in uh, 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 about Mach 10. Uh, about 300 miles above uh, the Atlantic Ocean, and we were able to fly it and control it as it came through the, the atmosphere. So, kind of maturing the technology for these inflatable drag devices. I already mentioned the solar sail. Uh, robotics, um, you know, I'll show you a little bit about this in a minute. Um, th this is uh, PhoneSat, is, is that little uh, phone that we mentioned that's been ruggedized that we hope to fly here next month. Um, and then up in the upper right is uh, the MSL heat shield. So, that's um, the instrumentation, you can't really see the holes there, but that's the instrumentation that I mentioned earlier that we measure for entry, descent, and landing. What I haven't mentioned is in the upper left, and it's nothing terribly exciting because it looks like a big tank. So it's a cryogenic tank. Why is that important? Well, one of the other big areas for us that I mentioned in propulsion is in cryogenic propellant storage and transfer. So this idea is that um, we use cryogenic fluids now in the rock, like the shuttle, right? Liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, uh, our main chemical uh, um, that we use for propulsion. The idea is that uh, if you want to go to deep space exploration, you may want to store these cryogens to enable you to come back. Maybe you take them out to a station, you can refill it like a gas station, and off you go. Or you can come back to the gas station, fill up your fluids again, and then go somewhere else. Or maybe you want to come back home. So this is the idea. All you have to do is store and transfer these cold liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. So it turns out that's really hard. <laughs> so it turns out the microgravity environment, uh, how do you determine uh, what's gas and what's liquid is hard. How do you get it to come out of the valve you want to do is hard. And also it boils off. Even in the coldness of space with, you know, with sun when it hits it, it gets very warm in the cryogenic fluids, it boils off. So our ability to store cryogenic fluids right now by the Centaur upper stage is about nine hours. For expiration, we need to turn it into nine months. And so it's a big physics problem and thermal problem about how do we store and transfer cryogenic fluids. And so we have a, a demonstration plan. We think we know how to do it. We think we know how to gauge and, and, and determine the amount of liquid in the, in the tank. And we think we know how to figure out how to get the liquid to come out and you know, feed into an engine. Um, so that's one of the demonstrations that we have. It's one of our larger efforts um, for uh, our technology demonstration missions. You know, we have a lot of hardware now. Uh, e even though uh, Space Tech's been up and running for about 15 months, uh, we started with, with appropriation, with funding about 15 months ago. In that time, uh, we, we you know, got a lot of hardware. Of course, some of these were from efforts that were uh, from earlier ago. But uh, that includes uh, some of the things I'll talk about robotically, including R2, our humanoid who's on inter the International Space Station. So this is the idea about humans and the presence of robotics. And I know many of you are familiar with that. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Spheres uh, are, are great little uh, GNC type devices that float around on station that we're doing some technology demonstration with. Um, and, and of course, a few of the others you know, that I mentioned. Um, I mentioned the game changing program. And I wanted to give a couple examples you know, again of it. Um, in the middle of this big, another big tank, <laughs> Um, is the idea about using composites. So on the station, uh, in fact, uh, it uses uh, the, 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 uh, the space shuttle uses a liquid hydrogen, a liquid oxygen tank, or it used to, right, uh, that's made out of aluminum and lithium. In fact, that, that tank, the, the basic ingots, are made here in Pittsburgh in Alcoa, as I just visited there yesterday. So aluminum lithium is the state of the art for tanks that hold cryogenic fluids. With composites, we think we can reduce that, the mass and the cost it takes to make such a tank. And so the idea is to use composite uh, either in, in an autoclave or out of autoclave to form a, a tank that can hold the cryogenic fluids. That has significant mass and cost savings if we can do so. So we have a project to demonstrate up to a five meter tank uh, by the Marshall Space Flight Center. This would revolutionize in terms of big structures for composite tanks. It's never been done before. And there's a very critical joint about where the outer tank and the inner tank mate it's called a Y joint um, that has actually been proven very hard structurally to be able to get to work. And so that's what this demonstration is all about. Um, you know, we talk a lot about uh, power. We do work in nuclear systems, the idea about you know, using uh, uh, fission power to, to, to generate power. Um, it's tricky with nuclear you know, radioisotopes. But for the wave of the future, 
if we're going to go deep space exploration, you know, we can see where using radioisotopes is a way to go for power generation, especially as you get further and further away right from the sun. Uh, the other thing we talked about was um, um, we talked about CubeSats. One of the other challenges for CubeSats is how to launch them, right? So they're very inexpensive to make, but how do you get them to orbit? And it turns out that finding a launch is one of the challenges. We're working with the Army on something called SWORDS. Uh, it's an acronym that doesn't really help you, even if you heard what it is. But it is basically a low-cost launcher. Uh, if we could get uh, a, a very uh, deployable, um, small system inexpensively that could launch you know, a few, hundred, a few uh, kilograms, tens of kilograms, to, to orbit, um, that would change the game for, how, for CubeSats. So those are some of the projects, just to give you some sense of the type of work we do. Pretty broad, pretty diverse, across a number of fronts, tackling a number of the problems that we have in, in the agency. Um, let, me, let me move a little bit to, you know, because, because I'm you know, at, at Carnegie Mellon, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing in one of our programs that's called Space Technology Research Grants and Fellowships. So I mentioned earlier, um, we have 128 fellows um, across 50 universities. I think three or four are, are at CMU, or have been at CMU between the two classes. I'm about to pick my third class here. The evaluation is ongoing right now. I hope, hopefully, some of you or your peers apply. Um, these are, again, for, mat for masters and PhD uh, for US citizens. It, it's a great program, uh, really, to engage the community. It's more than just uh, you know, paying for tuition. But it also involves travel money, money for lab and hardware, money for your faculty advisor, and uh, a chance each summer or throughout the year to go to a NASA, one of our 10 NASA centers. And so the idea there is to build that network and build that community. And so we've had good success so far. Again, we're just getting started. But I wanted to make sure that, uh, that uh, you guys are all aware. You can see we've got a couple other schools. I mean, they don't really count, right? They're not CMU. But uh, there are a few other schools who, who have been interested you know, in the program. And uh, we're really trying to build that base. You know, in addition, I just wanted to point out last year, for those who don't know, uh, we also ran a, a competition for what we called early career faculty. So we were targeting faculty who were uh, six or seven years from their PhD, trying to help out as they get started. We had a couple topic areas of interest um, based on our space technology roadmaps that we have, and I'll, I'll mention about those in a minute. But, but we, we, I just wanted to show you a little bit about some of the areas that we picked uh, this past year. We, we do expect to come out. I don't know on a yearly basis for early career, but certainly on a periodic basis uh, to offer young faculty as a way to get started. In addition, we offer to any faculty, young or you know, new or old, if you will, uh, uh, grants as well. And so these are the 10 that we picked last year um, as well. I just wanted to, again, give you a flavor of that, about this is the type of, of work and we expect to come out every year for research grants for faculty members. So it's a way for us to get started to really tap into you know, the, best and the best and the brightest as we try to take on some of the problems. In this particular case, the areas we were looking in were uh, radiation protection. That's one of the big challenges we have in space is how do you protect humans, in some cases electronics, from radiation. It's a problem, at least on the human side, we don't really have a solution to. Um, there's a number of ideas out there. I don't, I don't think any of them really have panned out uh, in the way we need them to to solve the problem. The other area we were looking at was in terms of thermal management and better thermal systems. Management of, of heat, uh, management of temperature is a, is a big deal for our spacecraft, whether to keep it cold or to keep it warm. And so advanced ways to go do that was also a big area for us. And then the final area for us was in, was in wavefront control, especially in terms of x-rays. Um, this has a particular science focus to it. But those are some of the topic areas that we were interested in. All our topic areas are really driven by our space technology roadmaps. We divide the technology world into 14 areas. Uh, we call them technical areas. Number four, by the way, is robotics. Um, but, but we lay out then, along with the National Research Council, um, uh, the, which they produced a final report on, here are the areas that we think. There's 293 technologies that are laid out in those 14 areas. Uh, we work with the NRC, and we priori prioritize those 293 technologies to a top 83. Uh, those were broken down by six or seven per the technical areas. We then took the 83 <laughs> and, and prioritized those into 16. So we actually have the top 16 of the areas that the NRC and in combination with NASA think you know, we need to go after in a big way to solve some of the problems that we want to address. And again, you can find that online or on our website, uh, nasa.gov, space tech, and, it, and we call them the space technology roadmaps. All right, so let's take a few minutes that I have left and talk a little about robotics at NASA. Again, some of this I think you're going to know, uh, but we're going we're to try anyways. Um, you know, 
uh, you can kind of break it up in, into these three areas. In fact, uh, I actually saw a better chart that I liked from John earlier today uh, that I probably should have stole in terms of you know, robotics and, and NASA and exploration. I really like yours better. But certainly um, going to different places, extreme environments, um, precursors for potential human exploration, um, looking at drilling, skylight, kind of the things we think about from a robotics perspective. That is certainly one, you know, one areas of capabilities that we need. The second are, uh, you know, helping, helping the crew, right? Helping uh, this exoskeleton is a project we're doing down at JSC. Um, you know, you, some of you may be more familiar with this uh, in your own work, but putting on uh, hardware to help you move, help you assist. Um, not only great for crew, we, we think, on the International Space Station or working in space, but also we have a partnership with the Veteran Affairs Administration, perhaps helping wounded warriors and others walk again or assist in their uh, able, the ability to move. Fantastic work. This is Rob Ambrose down at JSC. Then there's also uh, human robotics, um, humanoids helping to go do work. So R2 is an example of this. Many of you may be familiar with it. A partnership between JSC, Rob Ambrose again, and General Motors, and the idea about humans in the presence uh, of robots in the presence of humans. You know, in the manufacturing world, as many of you know, there are a number of, of, of robotics. Often, at least, they tend to be big and, and huge and, you know, can hurt people. Don't want to have humans near them. The idea here would be, could you work in the presence of, of humans? And, you know, and the astronauts in particular are pretty picky about this on the station about, uh, as you can imagine, about, uh, you know, uh, 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 robotics on board the station. And so R2 is actually on board the station. Uh, he doesn't have legs yet. Uh, we're working on the legs, actually, and we'll be shipping those up later this year uh, and attaching them to R2 so he can actually have legs. Um, I did get a question in an open house a few weeks ago uh, from a young girl you know, in a grade school who asked, you know, well, is he, where's the female version? <laughs> why is it just a he? So I don't know that answer. I asked Rob, why, why is it a he? I, I assume we're going to be working on, uh, on a female version. It was a tough question, which I did not know the answer to. Um, just to, we already talked about Mars. I think many of you know, but if you don't, right, we've sent a number of spacecraft, both stationary landers, including Phoenix and Viking, and of course, of course, the rovers, Sojourner, Pathfinder, a Spirit, Opportunity, right, and, and of course, MSL. We are now planning the next mission to Mars, Mars 2020, um, which is going to be a rebuild of the Mars Science Lab. It's going to be a real rebuild of, of Curiosity um, as we continue the exploration, following the theme of kind of, you know, follow the water. And now we do have, uh, due to MSL's recent work and recent ability to drill into rocks and chemical composition, pretty definitive proof that water did exist on the surface at some time in Mars. Don't, we, we don't know why and where it went and where and why, but we, we can show because of the composition in the rocks, right, and, and by what we know here on Earth and the, and the uh, analogs we have here on Earth, that water did exist on the presence of Mars. Um, Humans on spaceflight, we talked about this too, is R2, uh, as well as uh, telerobotics. Um, what I didn't mention, and there was a picture of it earlier, is also a big uh, work for us, especially out at Ames. Uh, Terry uh, Fong has been working on this, is telerobotics and the ability to control robots from a distance. So we're work one of the things that we're working on uh, is the ability to control a robot from the International Space Station. So uh, Ames has a, has a robot. We want to, next demonstration, we just worked out some of the communication links, though, is to have the astronauts on station control the rover you know, on the ground. In fact, we might get Charlie Bolden, our NASA administrator, out for that, uh, because we think it, you know, that's a pretty big deal um, as we move forward in, in exploration. You can imagine, as humans, we go in deep space, and we get near and around a planet, the ability to control rovers on the surface could have a significant advantage especially for something like Mars, where, like I said, it's really hard to get to the surface, the seven minutes of tear. Um, maybe you send robots down first. Maybe you, you can use robots, right, to go build your home or lay the groundwork for construction purposes before you go there. And so the ability to work out how do you control robots, right, is, is, is uh, something that we need to work on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we follow a roadmap, right? How do we know what to do or what guides us, I would say, in what we invest in, in what order? Um, tricky questions, um, not always straightforward answers, but to help with this, and again, these are online if you have any interest, uh, we put together uh, all these technical roadmaps, TA number four is robotics and automation, and it kind of lays out the path forward in terms of robotics investment. Um, I have one more movie here, if it works, and if it doesn't, we're not going to worry about that. Um, I had Terry Wong talk a little bit about the telerobotics work, but again, I don't think it's going to be uh, too happy with me, so I'll just skip that for now. Um, so in summary, for, in terms of upcoming robotics activities, 
Um, we're getting the legs to station. Um, we're working, continuing to work and augment these spheres. Uh, they were developed um, largely, I think, by MIT. Uh, I saw a group up there a few weeks ago um, still working with the Ames guys on ability to control, navigate, uh, interface to each other. And in fact, we just put a smartphone on each of spheres to allow the phone to control it. Again, just trying to show that example of using inexpensive devices uh, to be able to autonomously work in space. Uh, we're going to continue to work on the development of the exoskeleton. And also, we're involved in the, a DARPA challenge called Building a Hero. I think some of you are, are familiar with that. Um, even here is, is we look at extreme environments, right, into hazardous environments about sending a humanoid in um, to go explore, help, and figure out uh, these extreme environments. Another area for us that's big in robotics is led by our Goddard Space Flight Center, and that's in satellite servicing. So for those of you who, you know, satellites eventually run out of fuel or run out of a consumable, or perhaps, you know, something breaks and the asset, often hundreds of millions of dollars, is lost. So this concept, right, is can you go fix it? Can you go service it? Now today, the satellites are not designed to be serviceable. So you need to go in, if you're going to, with your autonomous, you know, uh, repair tow truck and cut wires, uh, add fuel, uh, remove safety caps. Uh, and so we're just at the beginning of figuring out how to do that. To do that on the International Space Station, we put a test bed in. And so this is what this system is, a series of typical caps and, and fill valves from spacecraft that are used today. And then a robotic arm along with manipulators to go and manipulate. We have done the, the most precise movement ever in space in cutting a you know, hair thin wire, uh, a safety wire. We were able to grab it and cut it and remove the cap. Doesn't sound like much, but from a satellite servicing perspective, a huge accomplishment as we push forward on the technologies. At some point, you know, we, we do believe we'll have uh, vehicles that can go again and service satellites. Now, this opens up uh, a number of things. Uh, orbital debris, if you're familiar with, there's a, there's a lot of debris in our orbit at this point from previous spacecraft and rockets. And you, you know, there's many arguments about the fact that it's growing. It's called the Kessler syndrome, right? As it continues to, to grow and, 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 and crash into each other and generate more debris, right? The situation is getting worse. And so could you imagine a spacecraft that could go clean up, right? The orbital debris removal. Uh, it's tricky. It involves policy because the only difference between servicing your own satellite, removing old debris, and taking out another nation's spacecraft is your intent. <laughs> the technology is the same. So it, it gets tricky. Um, some of you may recognize this location. And hopefully you recognize the person in the picture, please. Uh, President Obama announcing the National Robotics Initiative. Uh, he, you know, just uh, I was there today, right, in Lawrenceville in 2011. And so uh, a huge initiative across the government agencies. We in space tech, of course, are participating in this. And of course, so are you. Dr. Whitaker uh, is, is here as well. And these are some of the selections we made across a variety of fronts. We have about $5 million investment in the National Robotics Initiative, and we'll continue to do so as we move forward. So not only do we have our own you know, NASA-specific focus in robotics, we also enjoy um, partnering with NSF and other government agencies in pushing forward you know, on robotics. Still more um, are, you know, I mentioned prizes and challenges uh, that I mentioned earlier. We have um, upcoming challenges. I mentioned we've ran nine so far, nine challenges, six million dollars we've given out. We have a couple more that may be of interest, and I, at least I hope so at some point in time, you know, to this community. In June, we'll be back up at the uh, WPI up in, up in Massachusetts uh, looking for sample returns. So these are robots autonomously going and finding a sample and then bringing it back. It's not so much about the vehicle as it is about the software. Of course, you know this. Um, and so I you know, don't know if, if, if this has interest to you or not. But you know, it's a, it's a $1.5 million prize uh, that we're going to run again up in June. Um, in addition to that, um, we also have a couple more that you know, what I saw today that I wanted to mention. I, I don't have a chart on, but I should. One, one of which is we're, we're, we're beginning to put uh, the emphasis on uh, UAVs, autonomous uh, vehicle systems, right, area vehicle systems. Uh, collision avoidance and detection. So we're, gonna, we're developing a prize and a competition of can you take a UAV in a test bed, we're gonna, you know, in a site we're going to have, uh, fly around, avoid the obstacles, communicate, and show that you can demonstrate and work in the airspace. So that's a UAV uh, challenge that will be coming up uh, later on in about a year and a half. We also uh, have, what we mentioned earlier today, we were talking about the ability to survive lunar nights. There's the L word again. Um, but we're working on a challenge, what we call a night rover, the ability to look at energy density. We have a goal where we have a competition where can you demonstrate uh, to get up to around 300 watt hours per kilogram 
uh, and demonstrate that in a thermovac chamber up in the, the Glenn Research Center. Today's state of the art is around 100 watt hours per kilogram. So we're looking for technologies and solutions that will basically triple what the state of the art is today. Um, and so that's another upcoming challenge that we have in addition to the sample return. So UAV systems, you know, I saw a lot of that today. Uh, energy density, you know, we talked about that today. And then, of course, sample return. So, you know, from a robotics perspective, it's front and center in a lot of our prize competitions. My last chart, or almost my last chart, is a little bit, permit me, of just to, to look at a little bit of a big picture in an area that I'm not necessarily a specialist in like you. So I'm just going to go on a limb a little bit. Um, you may be really obvious to you, but, but at least it, in my assessment of what's going on in robotics, I wanted to share a couple of, you know, main observation is, you know, just looking at popular press of where we are today um, and what are some of the trends, you know, wh where is robotics, you know, taking us, what does it look like? And for me, it looks like you've done a hell of a job because here's the thing, right? Robotics has gotten to the point now with the capabilities, whether they be in humanoids or in UAV systems, right, or in cars that drive themselves, which you've been working on for some time, right? Um, at least those three, the capabilities are tremendous of what they can do to the point now where I think it's really become a policy problem, right? Uh, the, the capability is there. Now the problem is what's the policy? Are we going to be allowed to do so? If we have a car crash eventually from our autonomous cars, you know, who's at fault? How do, we, how do we deal with the insurance? How do we deal with the regulations? Nothing technical at all, right? UAVs, if you follow the UAV story, it's all about privacy. A number of police organizations, including the one you know, I live down in, in Yorktown, Newport News, uses uh, for a big festival event. They just have a simple little device that they can monitor crowd control. Not anymore. Right? The legislation has come in and says you can't do that until we work out the privacy concerns. Our ability to fly and autonomously uh, work with UAVs and, um, and you know, work around obstacles like we saw today, as a matter of fact, is there. It needs to be refined some, but it's there. Our, I'm sure that our UAV prize competition we're going to do is going to show that a number of people are going to be able to control UAV and avoid obstacles. The question is how are we going to resolve the policy issues? And then, of course, you know, Eventually, if we get into disaster zones, great work to go solve it, but there are policy questions there as well on responsibility, liability, kind of really boring lawyer, you know, lawyer things if you ask me. But they are important. So to me, this is where you know, technology really has kind of pushed the envelope um, to where we are today and across a number of fronts. It is amazing now, you know, if you think back to where we were about what autonomous ro robots, if you will, robotics can do today. Uh, the other one I picked on, and you know, I don't know the area of the other lab down in Australia. You guys may know Saul Griffith's work. Um, but I only pointed out that the other push is, and this is typical, for when you've pushed the capability far enough, right, you either run into policy issues or you run into, hey, we know you can do that. We know you have the capability, but it's too expensive. It's all about affordability. How can you do it less expensively? How can you make it cheaper? How, and, and so you see that push as well. Do you need all the, at least at his thoughts I see are, pushing away from motors and servos and going to pressurized systems, whether it be liquid or air, right, is a less expensive way. I'm not sure I believe it yet, but all I want to demonstrate is certainly that's a push that I see coming is, yes, we know it can do great things, but can you do it for, le for less expensively? The irony, of course, is you're the leader in inflatable structures with spacesuits. Yeah, yeah. I, I realize that, you know, but of course he's pushing on it for a different reason, right, that, than we are. Uh, you know, we're not really pushing on it for affordability. We're really pushing on it, you know, for performance or, or our ability to, you know, fit into a shroud. But, uh, but it, yeah, right, it's some of the same ideas. And you see some of the soft good work, for example, that's being done in these areas. And we see it in the soft good work, you know, that, that is done for hypersonics, hypersonic speeds and the temperatures that we have to experience is tremendous. It's tremendous. So my last chart, um, and I'll be, you know, open up for questions for what time we have is you know, an obvious one here for this group as well. And I saw it in a lot of the groups that I saw today as well. You know, it's not only the technology. In fact, what's almost really most important in the technology we're developing is the people and the people we do it with. And so you know, these are just some snapshots from the teams from across the projects, um, uh, across the board. I think I'm only in one of them, by the way. I was at China Lake for the rocket sled testing. That's the only one that we do. Uh, uh, but it is the people. That's what's really important. And so from, from across the agency that we have, we have 900 civil servants plus you know, thousands of contractors, you know, plus the you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, faculty members and students that are working on the problems. It really is this community. History has shown 
Um, if you look at any of the te technology developments, there's a great book about the history of Bell Labs. Uh, I think it's called The Innovation Lab. Um, the author escapes me, but you, know, you, can, you can Google it. Um, it talks about the history of Bell Labs, the great institutions in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 60s, uh, ended, I guess, in the 90s, unfortunately, uh, you know, due to the whole phone, the monopoly, you, you can trace the demise. But if you look at that lab and what it did, it was fantastic. And it has in it the history of the development of the transistor, huge, right, and the laser, huge. And a couple things come out of that, at least that I get. One is that um, technology development is very nonlinear. It re it's really hard to trace the exact path of who did what and how that transistor came out. It actually came in pieces. Same with the laser. In fact, if you look at the laser, and it was originally called the Maser, um, it's kind of hard to know where it came from and who really should take credit for it. Which tells me that um, you know, I'm not going to expect to do technology development and solve NASA's problems in a very linear fashion. Sure, I have nine programs, and they all have their TRLs. I really don't expect it to go from A to B to C. It doesn't work like that. What I can do is get a lot of really smart people working on my problems. And, you, and if I build that network and community, great things will happen for NASA and for the nation. And, you know, and we'll invest in, really, the nation's new technology leadership, you know, which is you. So with that, hey, I thank you for your time, and really appreciate your interest. Questions? Comments? I'd like to ask a policy question. It would sound hostile, but I, I think it's so hard. Because... <laughs> You're smiling. <laughs> So the original NACA or, or the original body was, was put together to make aviation safe and yep. you know, develop research that could help everybody. And maybe what eventually became NASA has been way too successful and it's blocking commercial efforts to just go wild in space. And you know, questions like, is space too regulated? Is space too safe? It's cost too much because our standards are too high. I think that's maybe a, yeah. NASA should back off. There should be a law that says you can only do things, you know, basically right. uh, ten thousand miles from Earth. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. That's a very good question, actually. Well, a couple things on that, and I'll say, and this is, you know, Mike is Eric speaking, certainly not NASA. When you talk about too safe, right? Uh, I, I I think about NASA uh, when it started, as you say, coming out of NACA. Uh, we're gonna, you know, President Kennedy, we're going to go you know, to, the, to the moon and return you know, men safely in less than a decade. I had no idea how to do that. Right? No idea. If you talk to anyone, and I've, I've, met, I've talked to Chris Kraft, I've talked to Arnie Aldridge, who was there in the original space tech group, they had no idea how to do it. They didn't have a communication structure on the planet, for God's sake. Right? They had to build everything from scratch. We've gone from that to, I think, when you see the NASA logo, I, I think a lot of people think of it as, oh, if NASA does it, it's the best. It's absolutely going to work. So we have become this symbol for failure is not an option. I mean, it's not bad as far as logo. I, I can imagine you know, worse symbolism. But imagine if NASA meant, those guys are nuts. Those guys will try anything. Those guys will take rip. I mean, DARPA kind of has that, doesn't it, right? I mean, you think of DARPA, you think, <laughs> it may not, why, why are they, well, do we want, can I push, I want to push on that logo a little bit, at least from space tech. And you know, I was telling earlier today, you've heard failure is not an option. For human spaceflight, that's really true, right? Got to have it. For technology, I stole it from Sandia National Labs. Uh, risk and tolerance is a guarantee of failure. I got to take risks to change the world. I, I got to take risks. When, when it comes, though, to, that's, so that's part of what I heard, you, you know, at least for you asked. The other part of it is, remember, NASA doesn't limit or regulate space. We don't. Uh, we're nothing stand there's a number, there's more commercial ventures today in existence than there ever has been. SpaceX, Space Tourism, x -Core, uh, let's see, B612, Planetary Resources, Golden Spike, there's at least two more. Uh, that are out, commercial ventures, privately funded, you know, we all from a government agency, we have to help fairly, right? We can't, we can't just go to one, I'll help you and you, uh, we don't like you, we can't do that. Right? We've got to help fairly. We're not standing in the way. There has never been, I argue this, there has never been a, a better time to be an aerospace engineer. You know, um, I gave the ending talk <laughs> three days of celebrating 30 years of the shuttle at Georgia Tech, I think last summer. And the last guy to give the talk had to talk about post shuttle. <laughs> so I had to make up something. Uh, w after watching three days of shuttle presentations and really celebrating a great vehicle, um, you know what? A, there was a common thing theme amongst those who presented on the engineering design of the shuttle. Do you know what the common theme was? 
They were retired. That work had been done in the 70s, right? All the excitement has been for the astronauts and flight directors. It's been great, and it is a great vehicle. But no one's building, there was no one for 30 years was building human rated spaceflight hardware. Today, there are no less than six companies building, testing, flying. Uh, the Boeings, Lockheeds, Blue Origin, Sierra Nevada, SpaceX, Orbital Sciences Corporation. I mean, you talk about hardware and development. Th th this is the time. Yeah, this is the time. Doesn't, you know, th this is the time. Aren't you looking through an incredible tunnel when you don't mention the word China? <laughs> Did you see this week's hearing with F F Chairman Wolf? <laughs> um, yeah, so um, certainly international uh, is a big part of space. And there are other countries such as China and India developing their own systems. You, you, you can argue how far they are along compared to what they say, right? Uh, they, yes, likely would. They don't have the NASA logo that you know we do today. Um, <laughs> however, we still remain even today by investment in space. I, I think Lori Garber just said we spend more in space. I think that all the other countries combined, it's not even close. So yeah, it looks a little. You know, we talk about their plans, but if you look at real hardware, real money, what we're doing, it, it, we lead the world in, in space development. So it, it's a challenge, but I, you know, I think I think we're okay. But the counter argument to that is we also spend more on health care, yet we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> if you read the, uh, I don't know if, if you read Time Magazine about three weeks ago, came out with a long special on health care. Did anyone see that? Yeah, I, I, I just punched the wall. Um, so I, yeah, I don't want to go, I, I do not want to do that, but our health care, that, that article really was completely illustrative of some of the challenges we have. And you know, by the way, we all chose the wrong career uh, if you want to make money, because that system is wired you know, for uh, certain individuals. No, we picked the right career because what we do is fun and exciting. You know, they have a lot of headache. I saw you first. So, so I mean, NASA is kind of almost chronically underfunded compared to what it could be doing or should be doing or wants to be doing. Huh. What about gains being made by partnering with other countries' agencies, like sure. the International Space Station? How easy is it? Uh, yeah, completely. well, so what is the percentage of NASA's budget compared to the, the federal budget? It's less than 1%. Yeah, it's 0.4%. So a lot of people always think it's higher. It's 0.4. When it was Apollo, it was about 4%. So it's about, it's about 4 or 4%. It's about $50 a family in the United States for NASA's budget. Um, yeah, some would argue we have more content than we have budget for, right? Because remember, we're doing earth science, right? We're doing weather. We're doing aeronautics. We're doing, yeah. So, I probably would argue we have a lot of content for the budget we have. I think we do, you know, frankly, a pretty decent job given all the work we have to do. Internationally, you know, it's a mixed argument. Uh, if Bill Gersenmeyer were here from Human Spaceflight, my peer, he would say, Internet, we are. Have you, have you seen the International Space Station, right? A couple of the modules are built by Italy, right? Uh, Europeans are providing a significant role. And, and, and we rely on Russia to get there, right? So clearly international cooperation. Um, so I would say, and, and that in science, Absolutely fantastic international collaboration in science. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be launched in 2018. You know, the next great observatory is going to be launched on an area and right off of ESA. Plus, they're contributing one of the major you know, sensors to it. The challenge with international, like all agreements, is you, know, you can't exchange money. So you need to work out a trade. You provide something, this is what you get. For science, the currency is data. Right? The currency is you make a measurement, your whole science community right, will benefit. For human spaceflight, the currency is seats, astronauts, right? The countries want to have an astronaut. Uh, we just had our first Canadian commander of the space station, right? Hey? Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's there. From technology, um, you know, I'm just beginning that. I was over at the Italian embassy just this week. Uh, we're really beginning, in, you know, what's the currency in technology? And the ITAR rules, right? And, and for, you got to be careful. And if you've read the news recently, NASA's had a little trouble with this, and Chairman Wolf, who's the appropriations chair in the House, is particularly concerned about some, you know, some nations. And so it, it, it's tricky. We have help, though. We have organizations within NASA to help us. Let me go. I don't, I don't know how long I have, so I'll just keep going. Um, given how closely related machine learning is with uh, robotics, we've yes. seen a lot of um, growing opportunities for research at NASA with regards to machine learning projects. Yeah, so um, I, I'm aware of some of that, but I, I have to tell you, I don't have a lot of details on, on machine learning and, and that. We have there's some elements within NASA, but I, I don't have great familiarity with them. I sorry, I don't know. Any other questions, or are we are we wearing, wearing anybody else? Let's call that a day. All right, thank you very much.